Hello, everyone. Welcome to Serendipity Wines Appalachian Deep Dive Series. Every great wine communicates a sense of place. Uh, each one of those wines has a story to tell, the history, the journey, the collected knowledge of each vintage, all accumulated in a glass. It is our aim at Serendipity Wines to give you a glimpse behind the scenes and bring you some of the magic of wine a little closer to home. The first uh, winery uh, of the day is uh, Castello Romitorio, which means uh, Castle of Romitorio. Uh, the winery is located uh, on the west side of Montalcino, surrounded by forest all around. Uh, incredible place. Uh, Sandro Chia, which started the project uh, in the 80s, uh, gave uh, to the son, Filippo, which is here today, uh, when he was really young, the project of this beautiful place and land. And Filippo started at 360 degrees, uh, all the aspects of the winery, of course, vineyards, wine cellar, commercial points, because when I talked with him, uh, he, when he was 19 years old, he was already in the United States and started and sell his wine. So long story behind. Um, well, to, I want to welcome to everybody Filippo Chia. Ciao, Filippo. Ciao. Buonasera. Ciao. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Serendipity, for having me and for attending this. Um, Thank you. Thank meeting. you. Grazie mille. Uh, let's get straight to the first question, of course. Uh, um, of course, uh, um, your story is... Everybody have a long story, okay? But uh, how everything started, how you fell in love with uh, your land, uh, your project, uh, and tell us about it, please. Well, I was uh, privileged enough to have my father who fell in love with this abandoned fortress in the, in, in the forest, in the north of Montalcino, in the early 1980s. It was, the, uh, it was owned by a friend of his, the Baron Giorgio Franchetti, um, who, who asked him, sent him some photos. He was in New York doing a show for Gagosian um, and soon after at the Guggenheim as an Italian traveling to, to New York as an artist, Italian artist. Um, and this collector tried to convince my father to trade this fortress, abandoned fortress with, with no vineyards at the time um, for a couple paintings. And basically uh, he bought it in 1984. I was born in 1983. So for me, I remember since the first days of, you know, being able to talk or walk this incredible structure, which um, Romitorio means hermitage. So in the positive sense, it was a place for, for monks to, to reflect, to, as all hermitages are, they're apart from civilization, a little distant from everything. Um, and in the negative sense, it was kind of a prison. In fact, it already exists on Roman maps um, as a prison for for Christians running away from Rome. We have to think that Maltalcino is on a very important ancient Roman road called the Cassia. Um, so if Mozart or Leonardo da Vinci or, or any emperor were to be going to Rome, he'd have to pass. Uh, it, there was only two ways to Rome, but one of them passes right beneath the city. Um, and the fortress, what you see today in the photos, was fortified for the battle against uh, Florence, which is the, a battle you were describing uh, earlier, um, what's, what's very special about this fortress is that it doesn't have towers. It, um, it doesn't look like a classical castle. It looks more like a really kind of Tibetan monastery. Um, and, and it's an island that is a, erects out of the hill at 400 meters above sea level. And I have to say that as a child, I remember the first works in the vineyard reclaiming the fields that had been abandoned since the 60s, more or less. And we're the 42nd winery in Montalcino. So if there was 11 in the 60s, in the 1980s, at this early stage of the 1980s, there was 42. Uh, today, I confirm there's probably 200, if not more. Well, that is great. That is incredible. Uh, of course, uh, you so, have a, a, a lot more to say, but we, we, we keep it short. <laughs> of course, short and sweet. Uh, no, but it's, it's a okay. love story. It's a love story between an artist and an incredible structure and an incredible place. And Montalcino yeah. is full of incredible people who have been attracted to this highly energetic kind of island. 
rising out of these clay valleys. Um, and since I was a child, I've always felt this kind of really incredible energy there. And, and you see it in the wine. So there's, there's certainly something yeah. to say about that. Beautiful character in a, in a, in a wine, for sure. Uh, my, my, my second question, you is uh, I know you know your father is a, is an artist, pretty famous too actually. How um, you, you you pretty much I'm pretty sure you 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 get from your father the the artistic skills, okay? And uh, how you tra you translate uh, some time? I'm pretty sure most of the time your artistic skills, you know, in the vineyards or to create something cool at the winery, which will you you can use it. Uh, or inside the, the wine cellar like I know because I know this uh, you, you can create you create also uh, tools uh, farming tools like how how you, well, how you project that well you know there's it's it's a cultural baggage which is shared by the territory and the people who come way before me so it takes a lot of discipline and respect in terms of turning it into an art form and I think all of us Uh, working with Sangiovese in Moltalcino, whatever altitude on whatever face of the hill, um, are artists. And what we create are time capsules in a way. And that's, that's each vintage is a capsule of kind of photographing your territory, uh, your clones of Sangiovese, your altitudes, but most importantly, how you've cared for the vineyard. I always say where, let's say where, where energy goes, energy flows. So yeah. it's, it's in the vineyard is, is a vine that, you know, is very easy for it to get wild, out of control, takes a long time for it to harmonize with its environment, low vigor, um, treating it the right way, not feeding it too much, too little, pruning, uh, using your instinct to foresee whether to de-leaf or not, um, and, and also to try to see what your end result is. And that should reflect always the character of the producer. And most yeah. importantly, of the territory that you're working in. So in particular, yeah, so I love, you know, the countryside and I, and I see the hard work and the hands-on discipline it takes. So sometimes we have to, you know, weld a tool, which is just specific for one particular vineyard or, or, in, or modify a scissor or, or whatever. There's, or yeah. raise a wire or fine tuning that um, over the course of many, many years, And most of all, zoning. So understanding within one vineyard, there's so much soil variation, Moltalcino, that within the same vineyard, you might also, not just because of the clones, but because of how they ripen and because of the depth of the soil or because of the level of calcium or, or whatever, that they may react in, in a rainy vintage in one way and a warm vintage in the other. So it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of love, but it's, it's like making a painting or it's like making a piece of music. Yeah, you, Filippo, uh, that, that is awesome. And, uh, you know, I want to jump in, in this conversation about, uh, uh, you know, mo when, when people says, oh, Brunello di Montalcino is a terroir-driven wine, no? Like, uh, how, how we, we explain the terroir? How, if we walk around your vineyards, what we see around that vineyard? Well, when what we is talk the terroir over there? About Brunello, we talk about a Sangiovese adapted to a specific terroir, correct? So... So yeah. we're actually talking about a very sensitive grape um, that has variable skin thickness, that has variable seed ripening, that has variable clones, small berry, big berry. Typically, the old world was the big berry. So I was fortunate enough, and it, you, you kind of, it's part of a hereditary thing. I didn't plant the original vineyards. My father planted them in the early 1980s, um, but with the help of, of Gianfranco Soldera or the few guys that were around there that were in town and making wine. At the time, it was very few people. Um, yeah. And, and that, that kind of contained culture and, and cultural baggage allows for the grape to modify itself within the territory. So what I, when, when you talk about Sangiovese and Moltalcino, it comes from hundreds of years of adaptation. And, and it really reacts very differently than other parts of Tuscany. So for sure, it's a terroir-driven wine. Our terroir is north. So the cooler the terroir, the thicker the skins. So I make a big, powerful mountain Brunello. It's tending more towards kind of maybe the violet aspect, the rosemary and sage aspect, rather than the kind of bright cherry, 
that you get sort of in the more clay, um, clay valley type terroir. That said, um, we're in the north, so you can generalize that the north probably has darker, um, more powerful wines. And that has to do with sun exposure. Uh, the thicker the skin, the darker the wine. And that's not to say that it's better or worse. Some of the best wines in Montalcino are quite transparent and translucent. But each territory uh, expresses itself in the same, in different ways, even the same grape. So what's beautiful about Montalcino is we have the southern side, the northern side. I'm in the Bosco, so in the forest. So expressing this, this foresty, darker um, energy, one of the last to harvest probably in Montalcino, not, you know, I'm not for sure, but uh, pretty positive about, you know, the last, the tail end of the, of the harvest season. So risky in a cold vintage, risky in a cool vintage, but certainly in, in, you know, with the trend happening now, it's, it's become quite a revelation, this hill. That is great. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the explanation of the terroir. Incredible. Uh, so after the terroir, of course, we got to talk about the wine, Filippo. <laughs> uh, they, of course, the 2016, which one uh, we tasting together. I see a lot of people already start to taste. Uh, I want to start with the label. If you have a briefly uh, describe this label, your labels are really artistic, of course. Uh, you explain why. Uh, well, what represent for you this label? Well, the label is clearly a painting of my father's. It's a large oil painting, three meters by 16 meters. It was, a, it was a big oil painting installed in a restaurant in New York in 1981. Um, and when my father was just a wee boy from the streets of Florence, strangely enough, even with all the history of Florence and Siena, who migrated to New York to make his fortune with painting. He comes from humble backgrounds. And I think that this painting, the way I interpret it, is man meets nature. So the, the horse, which has always accompanied man in the, or, or humankind in the work of the vineyards, along with the ox and so forth. And there's also something else to say, because this restaurant was called the Palio. And the Palio is one of the last tribal cultures in the Western Hemisphere. And Siena is very tribal in this, in the sense that the town of Siena is divided into different neighborhoods. Each neighborhood has its horses, has its jockeys, has its um, coat of arms, has a very deeply ingrained culture um, that ends with uh, one horse race, actually two. And the prize of the horse race is a painting. So the highest level, it's not money, it's not uh, you know, whatever, wine or food, but it's actually a painting. Um, and over the course of the past 500 years, um, this, this horse race has become completely ingrained in, in Southern Tuscan culture okay. um, and, and, and is also reflected in Motolcino. So this is kind of an ode to all this ancient, um, uh, you know, kind of medieval culture, but interpreted in a very modern way. So it's, it's a beautiful... Uh, in the background, you see kind of a futuristic, uh, yeah, abstract yeah. thing happening, but it's hard to, to describe, I guess, a painting at times, yes. but I'm better at probably describing let's, the wines. Filippo, let's jump to the wine. Of course, I have your, your beautiful 2016 in my glass over here. Okay. And uh, um, tell us about uh, the vinification will be and uh, the how it's supposed to be taste, how... Uh, supposed to be how it tastes so and uh, how you I, think uh, he will develop i would start with a few more how, minutes okay excellent how many minutes do i have just to uh, get it? two three minutes okay so i would start just with the with the way we harvest it's all by hand it's in by plots um then it comes in the cellar and it's it's destemmed um and selected kind of grape by grape so i have four or five people i don't use optical banks so it's all hand selected it's the same team that's been making wine for 30 years. So my cellar master started with us when he was 16 years old and is still working with us. Um, so it's about knowing the territories, knowing when to harvest what and foreseeing what's happening. Then we're going into the cellar. We're doing open tank with lots of oxygen because oxygen really helps the polymerization of the tannins. So we have really beautiful, silky tannins. As I said, we do long extractions, so open tank, conical um, tanks. We, we don't do pump overs, we do push downs. So it simulates the old 
system of the stick. Um, and then the wine is going into the big barrels, classical uh, big barrels, and a small part of second or third uh, uh, passage tonneau, 500 barrel, uh, French barrels, very small part. Um, and at the end, we're tasting, monitoring, putting everything back together. And it really expresses the energy of the forest, a powerful Brunello, um, I think very, very long lived, obviously depending by the vintage. I can't, you know, there's, there's no way of saying that generalize across your whole production forever that your wine's going to last forever. But this 16 is a wine that I suggest anyone to leave it open for a great deal of time. In fact, the little bottles that you probably are tasting now, it's showing quite well because it's a wine that yeah. at this stage takes a little time to, to open. Um, but that, that means that it's, it's built for the long haul. So it's, it's certainly a wine that expresses the dark northern part of Moltalcino, high altitude, uh, uh, a mountain Brunello, um, but made I with... I can Brunello. taste that, to be honest. Uh, fantastic expression on the nose, also on the mouth. Like you said, we, we opened this, I opened this bottle pretty much this morning, several hours ago, and uh, it's beautiful. Like you said, it's a mountain uh, uh, Brunello. Uh, Filippo, I mean, I'm... They're not done. Thank you. Thank you so Grazie. much. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I really appreciate that you're all, everything you said in the last 15 minutes. And uh, we... And may on. I just add one thing? Yes. Really, Sangiovese is all about chiaroscuro. So it, it's very, very sensitive to the vintage. And the 16 is a great vintage, cold nights. And it tends towards that powerful kind of more scuro the darker part of, well, maybe the 15s being a little warmer, thinner skins, more elegante, more accessible now. So you see just great variation and you see it within the same vineyard. You see it within the system of Moltalcino, which the rest of the team will describe. Yes. Um, but it's a place full of fantastic, passionate, incredible people. And I'm so proud to be part of it. Thank so you, Filippo. Grazie pleasure. mille. Grazie. Grazie. I, I, I see... I see people applauding. <laughs> I want to thank the old guest, our guest again, uh, customers, uh, the wineries. Uh, for me, it was an incredible an hour, an hour and 15 minutes uh, conversation. I hope everybody enjoyed. I hope everybody understood uh, what is the potential of Montalcino uh, from now to the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, and uh, do business with you, for all of you. And uh, Saying that, uh, I hope uh, um, you guys uh, support this important producer and be inspired to showcase their wines and uh, on our in your list uh, on your wine shops. Uh, uh, for us, it's really important. Again, uh, um, please, if you want to place any orders, I'm pretty sure you will contact your sales rep right away today and uh, make orders because. Uh, uh, we know that the allocations are not big and they will run out uh, really soon. Um, I want to say ciao, grazie mille, thank you so much to everybody, and uh, hopefully we see you soon at the uh, Icon Series. Thank you, guys. Ciao. 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 Thank you. Ciao, ciao a tutti. Ciao, grazie. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. ciao a tutti. Ciao a tutti.